Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Yes, I'm doing this one on camera for a special reason. Today is April 1st, and I will be reading everyone who posted their birth date on the correct community tab. If you posted them in the videos, I didn't see them or take them down. As I said, um, birthdays are easier to read on the community tab. Cool? All right, let's get started. For those of you that don't want to listen to this, you can go ahead and skip ahead. And as well, if you were on this list and I pronounce your name wrong, please forgive me. Some of the screen names are kind of wild. Cool? All right. User XY, the third. Eddie Ann, the fifth. Lexo XO, I think. The sixth. Black Widow Envy, the eighth. Ray, isn't it? I think. The eleventh. Bandit 06, the thirteenth. Smoky Forage Girl. Your 13th anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Jessica Kelly, the 15th. My sister from up above in Canada. 242 reads. The 17th. Genesee, the 18th. Yvette Hernandez, the 18th. Morale Brown, the 19th. Ten Batala Ochun, <laughs> the 20th. And then we've got... Mezalinski, I think it is, the 21st. Patricia, I-02CN, the 21st. Jay Kelly's son, the 24th. Happy 18th birthday, and also, welcome to adulthood. <laughs> Enjoy your day, buddy. Olivia's cousin, Shauna, 26. Mariah A. from Wisconsin, the 27th. Lexo XO, her son, on the 28th. He will be five. Happy birthday, big guy. And then we've got Call Me Carter on the 28th, Samantha Elizabeth on the 30th. I wish you all a very, very happy and safe birthday. Awesome. And for those that are born in May, I will let you know when it's time to post those. So, with all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, Let's Not Meet. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purses. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> okay, okay. <Ugh. laughs> Jesus. Oh, God. It's for purses. Okay, anyway. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So one night, me and my friends were playing some hide and seek in our hometown. We were probably like 13 at the time. So I went into a small area that is basically like a shortcut from the main road to the side road. I unfortunately went alone and I didn't even think of what can happen. Remember, we were only 13 at that time and we didn't bring phones with us. So if something happened to us, nobody would even know. So the game started and I ran sprinting to the woods area. First 30 seconds was good. Disclaimer, we have a rule that if we have to come to the checkpoint where we start and we have to save ourselves from not getting picked to search. After around one minute, I started hearing footsteps. I say, hello, are you one of my friends? And something that was there didn't say anything. So I started backing out. Fortunately, the woods area has a main route and two side ones, so I could have ran either way. I started backing out, and from nowhere, the man just appears from the woods and starts sprinting at me while saying, I'm gonna catch you, in a creepy and eerie way, like a kidnapper. Fortunately, I trained football, well, for the American soccer, so I knew I can definitely outrun him or at least make him tired. I sprint all the way through the woods with only light being the moon above me. And after about two minutes, he gave up. 
I continued sprinting and got myself all the way to the checkpoint and told all of my friends what had just happened. Of course no one believed, but I didn't care since I knew it was real. To this day, I still don't know who or what had tried to catch me that night, but for sure I know it wasn't a sports guy. The outcome would have been very, very different. So, whatever that was, let's not meet again. This particular close encounter of mine occurred sometime in 2005. I was somewhere between 11 and 12 years old. My mom had just moved back to her hometown of Kuskia, Idaho, a teeny little town with a population of approximately 654. She came across a little cafe called the Idaho Backroads that had a for sign sale in the window. She wandered in and discovered the place was still owned by friends of hers from years back. They were an older couple who were coming up on their retirement age. They were eager to sell, and soon enough, my mom was the proud owner of a quaint little cafe. We spruced the place up. It had minor wear and tear. Those older people couldn't routinely take care of. And reopened in the summer of 2005. It was a mom and pop sort of place called the Idaho Backroads Cafe, located in a small town on the Snake River called Kuskia, Idaho. Kuskia is a pretty much the last stop on Highway 95 if you're heading out to Missoula, Montana. There's a smattering of tiny towns in between, but Kuskia tends to get a lot of tourism in the spring and summer months. When my mother bought the back roads, we often ran into touring elderly people, families, lone travelers, and bikers. Our food was decently priced, and to several customers, it tasted like home. Well, the cafe was our home, as we had a teeny tiny apartment in the back, in which we all lived. My older sister, Talia, lived with my mother full time at 16. Myself and Shania lived with her father during the school year, until our mom could find a better place to live that suited three girls. We were excited to work and live in our restaurant. Yes, all of us worked that little cafe, as my mother could only run the restaurant and pay bills, not hire on a full-time staff on the payroll. Like I said, Kuskia was a small town, and once tourism left, we scraped by until the next season. As a 12-year-old girl might believe, it was great waiting tables. It actually was at the time. I was a small blonde girl with gangly limbs and a quick smile. This kept the tips flowing as little old people find children irresistible and were incredibly generous. I saved my tips for various things a child wants, but mainly I stashed the money away to help pay for school supplies. My mother raised us to be able to take care of ourselves and that earning our own money for things you wanted was rewarding. Our little apartment in the back was one open room with two doors on opposite walls from each other, and there were no windows. A narrow hallway led to the laundry room of sorts with a stackable unit of a washer and dryer, two huge freezers and a linen cupboard. Answer section was a ridiculously small bathroom, painted a Pepto pink, if I remember correctly. Next was the storage room with our business slash family computer, Windows 98 Gateway. Our bigger ridge and a sort of walk-in freezer that one small step away and you were in the kitchen of our eatery. Out back, we had a gated pen in which we kept our family dog during restaurant hours. Reggie was just growing out of her puppy stage with her two big ears and gangly legs. She was a wolf and German shepherd mix and was 
starting to grow into all the muscle of a shepherd while maintaining the look of a wolf. She was a beautiful thing, all white, save for a patch of red that ran along her back and tail. She was bought for my older sister, but being a grand majority of wolf, she regarded us all as her pack. One particular day, midsummer, we were all diligently working away when a man came into the restaurant. My sister, Sienna, seated him in a booth and took off to grab a menu, water, and his cutlery. I was working that day as well, and something seemed a little off about this gentleman. All I remember about him is dark, shaggy hair, his slumped posture, and more than a week's growth of uneven beard. She set his things down, politely smiled, and said she would be right back in a jiff to take his order. My mother, who happened to be standing at the till, was eyeing the stranger with an unsettling intensity. My mom, in all things that she's done in her life, was a correctional officer at a prison for a number of years. She instinctively knew how to spot trouble. She was very wary. As I walked by with an armful of dirty dishes, she squeezed my shoulder and told me to go take a break. We weren't particularly busy at the time, but it was quite odd of her to ask me to take a break so early in the day. I started to politely protest, but she squeezed my shoulder a little harder this time. And she looked me in my eyes with that, don't argue, child, look, that you must don't agree with. So I shrugged, dropped my dishes off with Jasper, our dishwasher, hung up my apron, and went outside to check on Reggie. When I walked outside, I let the back door open, like I always do. She sat by the gate, fully at attention, with an anxious look in her eyes. I reached out to scratch her ears, which she normally loves, but today she took this almost stoically looking past me and into the apartment like she wanted to come inside. I could not do that during business hours unless it was raining and we put up the baby gate on the threshold of the kitchen to keep her from trotting around. I talked to her for a minute or two and turned to go back inside. She let out a whimpering growl and tried to hop the chain link fence after me. I shushed her and told her to stay put and she reluctantly obeyed the command. Being a clever dog, she would have opened the gate herself but since she had done that in the past, we had clipped a chain around the gate, latched with a padlock. And even if she was intelligent, she still didn't have thumbs to turn a key. I closed the door she let open, a pained howl, like she needed to come with me. I did not wish to anger my mother by letting Reggie roam free in our eatery, so I firmly closed the door and made my way outside. Fifteen minutes was long enough of a break, and it was nearing noon. Lunch rush was coming. As I approached the kitchen, I heard a commotion. I froze on the threshold in mid-stride. Jasper had his back to me and looked extremely tense. This was completely abnormal, as he was the sort of hippie type and was incredibly laid back. I glanced around him and saw the man from earlier standing in the middle of the seating area, screaming at my sister. He was red-faced and completely belligerent, waving his hands threateningly, spit flying everywhere as he loomed over my 13-year-old sister. In a flash, my mom was in between them, losing her calm establishment owner look. She had replaced this seamlessly with the angry mother beat stance. Jasper and our older sibling, Talia, joined her as a, well, a wall of flesh blocking Sienna from danger. I watched, terrified in silence. Talia was a intimidating 16-year-old. She often sparred with our mother and her fellow officers for defense training practice. She also played a variety of sports, and despite her shortened stature, she was pure muscle. 
The man continued screaming, making absolutely no sense as to what he was so angry about. Quickly, my mother subdued the gentleman, twisting his arm behind his back, and marched him outside, pushing him across the street to the gas station parking lot. He took a swing at her when she let go of his arm, and she subdued him yet again. I was scared for this man, belligerent as he was, for even attempting at hurting my mom. If she lost her temper with him, things would get deadly. She didn't fuck around with the threats towards her children. He waved his hands in surrender and storming off down the street. I scampered away to the apartment before she spotted me and quickly turned on the television, pretending to still be on break. She came in looking incredibly calm. She scanned the apartment reflexively, her danger bells still going off. Liza, we're closing for the afternoon. Come help, break down. This was a command, not for my boss, but for my mother. There were two different people. I jumped up immediately and came out. Talia and Jasper stood together, looking ashen and drawn. Sienna was just barely calm from hysterics. This is not an easy thing for her. She doesn't have the same temperament as my mother. Talia and I, she's a very timid individual. We turned the signs, cleaned the grills, set up for dinner, and my mom hung a sign on the door saying, out until five. Everyone went about their jobs in silence, save for the radio playing. It was an eerie calm. Mom sat in the corner booth with my sister, whose sobs had died down to hiccups, as she explained the situation to her. It turns out she had gone to take his order and hadn't heard something he'd said. She politely begged his pardon and asked if he could re please repeat what he had said. He just went ballistic from there, pushing her with such a force she nearly fell down, then just stood there screeching at her. We all calmed ourselves eventually and reopened at five that night. Business resumed as usual until around dusk. I saw him stalking down the street again. In this town, you can see the whole stretch of Main Street from beginning to end. I tugged on my mother's sleeve as she walked by me, and she turned to look out the window where I pointed. She stiffened as he approached the building. He didn't come in, he simply walked by, but he turned around immediately as my sister came by and looked at her. She froze and stared. His drawn, hungry face stared right at her, and he leered. He drew a filthy finger across his throat with a significant gesture at my sister. My mother called the police immediately. The deputy, Carlos, responded as he knew my mother well. They carted the man away, but since there's not proper holding cells in the town, they had to let him go with a warning. If he came near our family or restaurant, he would then be taken to jail. We didn't see him again for the remainder of business hours and soon let it go. Things happened sometimes and we figured he'd be gone. Night fell and we went about our business with cleaning up and shutting down shop. At night, before we went to bed, one of us always had to take the dog on patrol, as we call it. We would walk with Reggie through the entire restaurant, opening every door so she could look into it. And I mean it when I say she insisted on checking out everything. We'd start in the apartment and work our way out, opening doors for her so she could inspect. Tonight, it was my turn, so I followed behind her as she checked under every table and booth, in the bathroom, bathroom stalls, hallways, and the entire front lobby of the establishment. When she was satisfied with her inspection, she laid by the door to the apartment, and we'd reward her effort with a piece of deli meat or the occasional hamburger patty, if we had one left over. Then she'd pad off to the apartment and resume normal dog activity. 
We all went to bed at around 10.30, maybe 11 p.m. that night. My mom and I shared a bed while Talia had her own, and Sienna slept on the pullout couch. During the summer, we left the doors open and latched the screen door, one of the top and one on the bottom. The top was a hook and the bottom was a side latch. Like I said earlier, Reggie was a very clever dog and could figure out how things work very fast. So we doubled up on latches so she wouldn't go gallivanting around at night. We all quickly went to sleep as we all generally woke up at 4.30 in the morning to start preparing for breakfast when we opened at 5 a.m. Also, my mother was on Ambien for her sleeping issues and she slept like a rock. Everything was fine, but I'd woken a couple of times to Reggie letting out a hair-raising low growl of warning. I figured a cat was outside and she did not get along with them, so she was scaring them away from our door. I went back to sleep. What seemed to me like just minutes later, I jolt up out of bed to Reggie standing in the middle of the room, fur standing on end. I got up just as my older sister rose from her bed to inspect the problem. It was hard to see, as the back alley had no streetlights and the room was dark. Talia took a step away from her bed and Reggie went ballistic. All in the same moment as I sat watching from my bed, confused. She let out a snarl that chills me to this very day, fangs bared. I had never seen Reggie act this way before. She was always docile and gentle. Talia calmly approaches her and whispers, Reggie, what is the matter with you? In a hushed voice, my mother and other sister are stirring by this time, and mom is fighting her Ambien to wake. As soon as she said something, I hear a man curse under his breath. Shit. As if frustrated by the progress of something, Reggie no longer holds bark and flies into what I could accurately describe as the scariest thing I have ever seen in my 20 years of life and lunges full bore at the screen door. She barks ferociously, snarling and emanating noises that sounded like someone loosed Cerebus the Hellhound in our living room. She ripped through the screen in her rage, forcing her upper half through the mesh like it was paper. Now I heard him clearly cursing and screaming at our dog. Everyone was awake now, scrambling for light and yelling at each other in confusion. Reg was quite by the midsection in the screen and struggled so hard to break free, she knocked one of the hinges loose. I heard a snapping noise, like a bear trap on bone. The man screamed. This set our docile family pet into a frothing frenzy. She would kill him, even if she had to drag the whole door with her to get to him. I heard something drop and the man cursing as he struggled to break free from the jaws of our fierce beast that was our Reggie. My mother reached the door in slow motion, kicking it open and simultaneously cocking her pistol and taking aim. Somehow she'd managed to grab Reggie's collar and yank her back and pass her off to my sister, who dragged her into the hallway and locked the door. I heard Reggie's outraged howl come immediately after Talia locked her in, and it both frightened and comforted me at the same time. The man was gone in the black of the night, and Mom closed both apartment doors, locking them. She proceeded to the front of the cafe to call the cops. In the morning light, we inspected the door's damage. The man from earlier in the day had come back for his revenge and was wielding an intimidating looking knife. In a struggle with Reggie, he had dropped it on the welcome mat. He'd been trying to jimmy the pen from the screen's hinges out of the hinging mechanism. And that sound was what alerted the dog. 
The police canvassed the neighborhood in the early light and found a trail of blood from our back door heading a couple blocks west until it slowly grew to nothing. Police speculated the man was in a crouching position when Reggie busted through the screen door and had probably bitten him in the shoulder or arm region. They kept watch out for our would-be attacker and they never found him. If we didn't have her, I'm sure we wouldn't be alive to this day. Sadly, when my sister married, she took Reggie with her to live out of town. She got out one day and a hunter mistook her for an actual wild wolf and shot her illegally. She was one of the best dogs we've ever had and I owe her my life. I only wish she would have lived a happy full life she deserved and got to live to watch over my niece and nephews. So to the asshole that tried to break into our establishment, I hope we never meet again and you are rotting away in jail. Rest in peace, Regina. We love you. This happened to me back in 2007. I was nine years old and my brother was 14. My mom had sent us out of the house with about 30 bucks to go to a movie and maybe get a bite to eat afterwards. After watching the movie, it was getting pretty dark and I was ready to go home. But my brother wanted to get something to eat first and we agreed to walk to McDonald's, which was only a couple blocks from the movie theater. On our way there, we were stopped and approached by a man. He had a friendly smile plastered on his face and he was holding his child's hand. There didn't seem to be anything off about this man. He was average looking and seemed to be nothing more than a father having a day out with his son. Hey, do you two think you could give my son and I a hand real quick? He asked. We need help loading a mattress on the back of our truck. The truck is just up the road. Um, sorry, but we don't really have the time, my brother said. It was at this time I noticed the little boy. He was about eight years old, and he looked abnormally thin. He had a blank expression on his face and wore clothes that were too big for him. I turned my attention back to the man, who was now mumbling to my brother about how it would take only a second. My brother calmly declined again. Being the helpful kid that I was, I joined in with the man and tried to persuade my brother that we should help him out. I turned to my brother, who was now staring down at the little boy. My brother had a disturbed expression on his face as he looked down at the child. The child stared back at my brother, blankly. I didn't understand why my brother had that look on his face. He grabbed my hand and said, I think that's my mom over there. He pulled me and we began walking away from that man. I didn't understand what was going on and why my brother had just lied about our mom being there. He didn't let go of my hand and practically dragged me until we were a far distance away from the man and his son. I looked back and could still see the man holding his son's hand, only now, he wasn't smiling anymore. He had a look of fury on his face, and he yanked the little boy by the arm, and they walked away. I pulled away from my brother's grasp and bombarded him with questions. He shushed me and pulled his cell phone out of his pocket. He dialed in a number and began pacing around nervously while talking on the phone. I remember the police showing up, and my mom came soon after. She took me home, but my brother was left with the police. I asked my mother what was going on, and she said that the police were just questioning my brother because the man we had encountered was dangerous. That's all she told me, and I went to bed. By the next morning, I had almost completely forgotten about the incident, and things went back to normal. It wasn't until a few days ago that these memories flooded back into my mind. I decided to call my now 22-year-old brother to get some answers. 
When I brought the ordeal back up, he finally gave me the information I wanted to know. And now that I know everything, I understand how fucking terrifying our encounter with the man truly was. My brother said that while the man was constantly trying to convince us to come with him, he happened to look at the little boy. The little boy then looked at my brother with his eyes filled with terror and mouthed the words, I'm not his son, please help me. Then his expression went back to being completely blank, almost as if he had never said anything at all. This is why he had become so freaked out and snatched me away. When he called the police, they hurried down and he described the man the best he could. They couldn't do much with the little information my brother had given because we haven't seen even the car that the man supposedly had. My brother told me that a few weeks into the investigation, they had found the little boy who was with the man dead. His body had been cruelly dumped into the woods. The cause of death was malnutrition and dehydration. I'm sorry, you guys. Oh, my God. I feel so bad for that little boy. Nothing like this should ever happen to a child. Okay, I'm going to get back to the story. Sorry. If my brother and I had gone with the sicko, we'd likely would have met the same fate. He obviously couldn't have kidnapped both of us on his own. As my brother was fairly strong, that meant he had other pedophile partners who would help him snatch up unsuspecting kids. Unfortunately, they were never able to catch any of the sick fucks who did this to the child. But the man was definitely not his father. His real parents had already been searching for their missing son for almost a month. The pedophile, or pedophiles, had managed to kidnap the poor kid and used him as their puppet to try and kidnap other children. Every time I think about that boy, I feel a deep pity for him. He was only a year younger than I was at the time, and I can only imagine how terrible it must be to slowly starve to death. And to the disgusting bastard who starves and murders children, you better hope we never meet. This just happened, and I'm still not sure if I wasn't tripping by accident. I had just come out of the gym, and like always, I decided to smoke a cigarette before getting on the subway. I generally do this because I love how futile it is to attempt being healthy while also having a smoking habit. It's a rainy day, and there's practically no one outside. I turn my back to the door as I attempt to light my cigarette. The door behind me was pushed open. I don't turn back. I heard footsteps coming in my direction and then stopping. I get that gut feeling that only happens when you subconsciously pick up that something is amiss. And amiss something was. I turned my eyes ever so slightly to my left to realize an elderly gentleman is standing just a few centimeters away from me. This poor guy looked a wreck, and I'm well familiar with wrecks. He seemed like what would happen if the Crip Keeper and Freddy Krueger had a love child, which they promptly locked in the basement over how repugnant he looked. His eyes were sunken, half of his hair was falling out in random spots. His skin was so spotty that Corella DeVille might want a jacket made out of him. I realized then that mange Jeffrey Dahmer there was mouthing something in a very raspy and hissy voice. He seemed to have a lot of trouble breathing. My lighter, he inhaled. I can't find my lighter. I offered him mine. Do you need a lighter? I asked. I attempted to sound somewhat cold and aloof, but instead coming off as the chirpiest fella of the Disney cartoons. He refused. 
I step back to gain some distance from him. All the while, this guy's eyes are on my face. I can feel them even if I'm not looking at him. I decide to gain some more distance between us and move all the way to the opposite end of the street. Like the millennial I am, my eyes were glued to my phone. I look up, realizing again that something is wrong. This forceless Darth Vader was nearly on top of me again. I almost jumped out of my wet boot. This guy was closer to me physically than my father has ever been emotionally. I stay silent, eyeing him, trying to figure out his next move. I'll call you God, he wheezed. Uh, excuse me, I ask, certain that my ears were more treacherous than that Slavic girl from MySpace that asked you for a credit card number in 2008. That is what a father calls a son. You're a son, aren't you? He struggled to say. I nod affirmatively, negatively. Then you are the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. Holy ghosting on tender Batman. This guy was obviously off. I take a few steps back as he bithered in both Portuguese and English about God and a son. I was pretty sure this was the scene where he'd pull out a knife and stab me through the jugular as O oh, Fortuna played in the background. Since my survival skills are null, I did what every 20-something does when threatened. I retreated into my phone's world. He huffed and puffed about God, me, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and some other shit that honestly I couldn't hear nor did I want to. Finally, he asks, Are you God? Without breaking visual contact with my phone, I answered, No. He begins to walk back, still staring at me, mumbling something under the warm blanket of his strained breaths. Finally, he leaves, just as he had entered, and leaving me even more confused than I already was. Am I, unknowingly, some reincarnation of a junkie god messiah? Jesus, pay a guy a drink before creating a cult around him. Am I right, boys? I'll keep you guys updated on that later. Random old men that put Philip K. Dick to shame with your religious insanity. Let's never meet again. But also, I hope you're safe and there's someone taking care of you because you are not fine, dude. Each year around this time, I open up my Time Hop app and am reminded of a night three years ago. Photos of softball size, black and blue bruises all over the right side of my body come up. I'm honestly somewhat thankful for that, though because it could have been much worse. I'll just never know. Three years ago, after a blackout Wednesday night with friends, I found myself locked out of my partner's, at the time's, apartment around 3 a.m. She was out with co-workers doing the same after her serving shift ended. We live in a big city, so I'd taken the train from where the night ended with my friends straight to her place and decided I'd just wait for her rather than head back home as the commute home would be another half hour or so and my phone was going to die. I was honestly just ready to sleep. In hindsight, I obviously just should have headed to my own apartment that night. After multiple texts and phone calls from me to her to come home, my partner, being thoroughly annoyed with me, was not in any rush to end their night. Drunk and upset, I sat inside the entrance of her gate to her apartment, and I was sulking. It was raining and cold, and I was exhausted. Putting myself in this situation alone was my parents' worst nightmare, but at this point, my phone was dead. I didn't even have enough cab money, and there was no way in hell I was walking 15 minutes back to the train station 
to head to my own apartment. A few minutes later, a man in a ski mask, sunglasses, and an oversized parka walks up to me. I remember him so vividly asking, are you okay? I responded that I was fine and to please stay away from me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I thought for a split second he was genuinely concerned. I mean, here I was, a college-age girl, sitting outside in the rain at 3 a.m. completely alone. But at 3 a.m., you don't just approach a girl dressed like that and mean no harm. He then brandished an exacto knife and then asked, Are you sure you're okay? He picked me up with one hand while repeating, striking at the back of my hood with a knife. All I could do was scream. I know I asked him why he was doing this, but I couldn't even bring myself to pull out the mace in my coat pocket. I was so stunned. Talk about fight or flight or freeze. I don't know if it was a car that drove by or my screaming that caused him to let go. But after the longest 30 or so seconds of my life, he threw me to the ground and ran, leaving me with those awful aforementioned bruises. I'll be forever grateful for the thick hood on my coat that came away with some knife cuts. Had my hood not been up, he would have absolutely sliced the back of my neck and head open. My partner pulled up in a cab a few minutes later. At least I think it was a few minutes. It was nearly a blur. I definitely went into a stare of shock. We called 911 from her charged phone, stayed awake for the police to come take down a report, but didn't hear much else afterwards. There's a decent amount of crime in my city, so I wasn't really expecting much to come out of it. What scares me the most is that, one, I still do not know what that man wanted. Number two, he knows what I look like, and I have absolutely no idea what he looks like. And number three, I'm pretty certain I was followed all the way from the train station to the apartment complex, which was fairly a long walk. Those three reasons still give me chills. Ski mask man, let's never meet again. This is a real story that's happening now, but this all really started on my birthday. I did speak with an attorney about these instances, but am open to hearing your takes as well. It's been pretty frightening. Quick backstory. I live with a female roommate, Julia, and her boyfriend. About a year ago, Julia and I started going to hangout spots and met a woman working there that was around our age, Sam. Julia and I stopped going after a while, but I stayed friends with Sam. Not super close, but seeing her once every couple of weeks. She supported my business, brought me small gifts, and invited me places over the course of the year. I enjoyed being friends with her. On my birthday, Sam and other friends posted my photo on social media. That's when I get a message from an account I don't know asking me to message them back and discuss a film opportunity. Half curious, I respond. They say a bunch to finally come out and say they are casting adult film stars. They quote me a large amount of money. He says it's very private. Porn sold overseas. No one will ever see it. I declined politely. Honestly, I chuckled. By the way, they're not Googleable. There's nothing on their social page or anything about their production company anywhere online. The person messaging insists I text their female reference. Curiosity gets the best of me because I do that. Female reference weirds me out. She's normally at first, but seems too excited about the actual job. She's encouraging me to do my casting with the person I've messaged and saying I'm very lucky he's even offered that. He's only offered that to a few girls. 
I'm thinking, no woman in porn really feels this excited, happy, satisfied with it all. I'm weirded out and she's blocked. He messaged me to ask if we talked. I say yes, but decline again. And he's blocked now too. I'm embarrassed I even considered, but then, a couple days later, my roommate shows me a weird text to her personal number. It's the same people with a similar offer. They say though, we found you on a list you must have signed up for. I'm sure my roommate did no such thing. I'll say here, not many people know both me and my roommate. I tell my roommate what happened to me. We are both just confused. For the next four months or so, I get text messages, all different kinds, all eventually saying, yes, this is, not Googleable adult film company here, and we are so sorry about the mix-up. I answer some nice, I answer some mean, I ignore others completely. They never ask for photos, info, anything really except to consider the offer and maybe come for a drink to discuss it in person. That was it. Until yesterday. Sam sends me a message on social media. It's a group chat with a profile I've never seen, plus Sam, plus my business profile. I do creative team building work. Sam wants to introduce me to her friend, Dave. Dave needs to hire a team builder as a fancy hotel about an hour away from me. Sam makes the introductions. I say thank you, and then Sam leaves the group chat. Dave's profile is empty. She messages me privately and says basically, I used to casually see this guy. He's good for the job. He's pretty wealthy, and I know he owns like multiple businesses. He used to be in adult film productions, but I think he's been done with that. And this would be for a different business he has. Other than that, he's a normal dude. I message the man back and ask, what's the company? And can I have a website or some pages? Any more info? He says, well, he will launch the website at the event I'm being hired for, and that he just bought the company and it's being branded. All right, this is weird as fuck. The guy is messaging me all along the lines of, sorry, I know this is weird. Feel free to bring your boyfriend. What? And he also mentions how he was seeing my friend tonight. I leave him on red until the morning. I send him the original weird adult film account and say, this you? They say no. And I say, uh, yeah, okay. They respond thumbs up and leave the chat. I had mentioned to Sam months ago about the weird offer and text messages I got. She too said she got bizarre messages in the past. They only stopped when she said she would call the police. She didn't offer more detail, but was driving, so I didn't push it. So now, I message Sam, and I say straight up, Sam, I think this is the person that has been harassing me from different numbers. She acts weirded out and surprised, asks about the original account that messaged me. Eventually, she closes the conversation and goes to bed. I left her on red. I don't answer her call the next day, and she texts me. Um, that was a weird last night. Call me if you want to chat because I'm confused. I don't respond. Today she texts me. Um, okay. I wrote her back, basically saying, listen, you know I've been weirded out about this and I've been wondering if someone is trying to abduct me and now wondering if you're involved either innocently or not. It's too much for me. She wrote me back saying more or less she understands that it was a scary experience, but she thinks I'm way overreacting and basically she seems offended that I even could think such a thing. She also said she wouldn't want to ever speak with someone again who could think about her that way. She left it with that she lives her life on the straight path and 
Can't let someone try and drag her into something like that. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can use a free website online to insert photos of someone and it will generate pages on the internet that match based on facial recognition. When I began having this fear of her involvement, I searched her and found what I am 99.9% .9 was thumbnails of her in an adult film, either her or her spitting image, as it also pulled known photos of her as well. I didn't say this to her, of course. I know, she knows. But that last statement she gave me is extra weird knowing all of that. So, that's my story. Hopefully, they don't get to me. I am not the one to be played with. So, to you freaky fucks, I hope I never meet you again. So this happened to my friend and I almost two decades ago, but I'm only realizing the severity of it now that I remembered it. We were like 10 and 12, both girls. We snuck out in the middle of the night on a sleepover because we had a dumb urge to get some cola. And during that time, the only store that was working nights was a small liquor store which was a 30 minute walk away from where our house was. It was next to a train station, which was a sketch place overall full with drunks and the like. But us being so young, we don't know that and we just went. The walk to the place was fine, quiet as midnights are in a small town. But shortly after we started walking back, we noticed a car going by the only car at that time, so we took notice. At first, we didn't think much of it, but then we noticed it drove past us again. And a couple minutes later, again. So we got alert and started walking faster. We were walking on the main street, which was pretty lit. So I assume now that the only reason nothing happened was because the person driving wanted us in a darker place. He took a turn toward a darker street once, trying to get ahead of us, but as we walked past it, he drove out of it and started following us. The moment we reached the street where we had to turn to our house, we took a sidewalk shortcut and we ran. The shortcut didn't allow the car to drive after us straight away, and instead he had to drive slightly straight, then turn right then right again onto our street. And luckily, the shortcut actually start turning to our street, and that's how we confirmed it was actually following us. Good thing the house was very close by the time he turned to our street, so he couldn't drive to us fast enough. But my God, when I think of it now, I'm even more frightened than I was then because I know what could have happened since I understand it more. We could have been kidnapped or molested or even killed. Who knows? At that time, my friend and I forgot about the situation the very next day because we didn't realize what could have been. I wished I was smart enough back then to have remembered the plate numbers or something. I hope that person didn't hurt anyone in that town. I now feel lucky nothing happened to us in my hometown is now a completely different light for me since the realization. So to the guy in the car trying to snatch girls off the street, let's not meet. And that dear listeners brings a close to these true let's not meet stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B, Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for continuing your support towards Back to Ashes. 
If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please stay safe and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.